I'm sitting on a bridge which is was built by in 1866 by William Lefanu for the Barringtons to join to go across the Glenstore Glen the Glen of the Stallions this is the Glen now this Glen is very important it contains a wealth of biodiversity it's an oak sanctuary virtually springing up with ferns everywhere it's a fern paradise but before we go in there I want to just read from the, the Glenstore Book of Nature which Fanny Howe who's an American poetess who comes here and who put this together for us she taught writing classes and we put this together she's talking about the formation of this Glen she drew this from various monks the, the information but the first, the major thing which happened here was that when the earth, all the continents were joined together, it was called 300 million years. The world was, was called the Panagia. I didn't know this, but that's when all the continents were stuck together. And then they gradually began to drift apart. Well, we know in Ireland the fault line happened at the cliffs of Moher, and off went America and Canada, and Ireland moved moved east. Well, according to your father Anthony Argeog, this glen was also a fault line and it could very easily have occurred here, in which case to my right, on your left, that could now be an America and I could be stuck in the Atlantic Ocean and this side would be Ireland. So I want to take, I'd like to read the very first little piece that Fanny included called Listening In. Are you in the writing seminar? Yes, and it's gorgeous. What goes on there? Well, we all try to write the truth, I suppose. That would be hard to do then. It really is. You know, Tolstoy said, the truth is like a lizard. You run after it to catch it. You grab hold of its tail and the lizard runs and you're left holding the tail, and the lizard grows a new one. Wonderful. So I want to take you into the glen because it's such a rich reservoir of plants and animals, and especially ferns. So let's go. So here is an example of a clump of bracken. Bracken not to be confused with the ferns, I'm the main fern I want to shoot, which is Dryopteris felix mass, well, which, which we'll get to. This reproduces by growing, creeping along under the soil, using a rhizome and then sprouting up. You're like a strawberry does above ground, it does underground. So it can reproduce and colonize the whole area and wipe out everything else. It's, and it's, huge it grows you, that's some of this is six two meters and it can grow even higher in some places so that's bracken it has had many uses it's been used in the soap industry it's been used making glass it's been used in the beer making as i said and also the rhizome has got a starch in it and that's been used for bread in the old days but People are, are, it's japan they use quite a lot of it but nowadays it's frowned upon because it has been linked with uh, cancer and, and also I think poisoning horses so it's not a very uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't advise eating either its leaf or its rhizome it has been used for bedding and for thatching as well uh, because it's it's so bulky it's so much of it think of all that growth it grows up all that in one year and then collapses into a brown clump in the autumn with the first frost and I can show you a bit of that there from last year collapsed and, and, and will rot back into the soil and provide nutrients to, for the next ones to come up. There's no waste at all in the woodland. Everything is reused.
This is a, a spreading wood fern, found commonly in the woods. And what's interesting about this one is that the sori, the sporangia, which produce spores, are black on the back of them. And we'll talk further about what, that, what they do when we see some other larger ferns. Now here's my, you know, that's, it's just magnificent. This is Dryopteris phalix mass. It's a different type of fern, the shield fern. As you can see why it's called the shield, they so like shields. Here's a, the, my favorite fern, the Dryopteris phalix mass. It's the one most people would be familiar with here in a nice shaded place. The fern is like the frog. It's equivalent to the frog in the sense that the frog, all life evolved from water and most of the things we see around us escape water and don't need to return there. But as you know, the frog has to go back to water to lay its eggs, to reproduce. And the tadpoles live in the water, then they come out and go back onto dry land. But it means the frogs can't live if there isn't water around and they've got to stay in damp places because their skin is porous too. But the fern is like that. The fern has mastered dry land to a large extent. It's got a thickish stem, which, it, which has got a, a transport system in it, a vascular system to transport food from the leaves down to its root and to support it, like trees. It's got a woody substance. So it's mastered that part, of it, which the poor moss never got a, a hold of. The moss is still low to the ground because it's got no woody material and it needs to remain moist all the time because its leaves have got no uh, lining to prevent the water evaporating, whereas the, the uh, fern, if you look closely, it's leaves, they're, they're deep, they've got a, a, a sort of film on them, greasy film, to prevent water evaporating. So they're successful land creatures, but like the frog, they must have moisture to reproduce. So what happens is, they produce these little sporangia, which I showed you earlier. These, and this fern, they're white. They produce a spore. And, it's, and that spore falls to the ground and grows into another plant called the prothallus, which is the size of my thumbnail. And that does the sexual reproduction for the fern. It's like the fern contracts out the process of reproduction for it, you know. Now, on the prothallus, it's on the ground, and it has a film of water underneath. And on that film, they produce sperm and an egg, and the sperm swim out, very like human sperm, swim along the underside of the prothallus and fertilize the egg. But if they don't have that film of water on the underside, they can't, that won't happen. Fertilization won't happen. So that's why you find ferns in damp, wet, places. They also are able to, they've adapted to utilize low light. They have a low compensation point. They can start making food when there's little light, whereas most trees need a lot of light before they start. Photosynthesis, making food using light. That's what photosynthesis mean. Photo light synthesis making. So they have that ability to use. And they also go on much longer in the season. These guys will be here right up till January, February. You can see just down here, I'll pick one up, the old frond from last year. Here's an example of the one that's died. And these are the new ones that came up in the spring to replace them. So the fern is partially successful inhabitor of dry land, but it is still a bit too evolved. Whether that will happen or not, I don't know.